Hey everyone, I'm Coral. Welcome back to my channel. I'm here today with all the books that I read in November. This is also sort of like a half wrap up of what I've done so far with the Clear Your Shit Readathon because most of what I read, I read for that. Okay, let's see. <clears throat> I like to do a couple of stats when I do my wrap ups just to, um, I don't know, I just like it. So first, uh, in total, I read 10 books this month. Two of them were thrillers, six of them were horror books, and two were fantasy. I read a total of 3,244 pages, which is about 108 pages a day. I had a page goal at the very beginning of the year to read 35,000 pages, and I've surpassed that. So by now, I've read 42,521 pages. Excellent. I also had a goal to read as many books as I can off of my TBR, which I consider to be books that I've owned previous to this year. So for that, I ended up reading seven books that I've previously owned, which is really good. Seven out of 10, 70%, I get to see. The years these books were published, they're all pretty recent. The oldest one I read this month was published in 1996. Then we jumped to 2012, 2014. I had two books that were published in 2017, a 2018 book, two from 2019, and two new releases. Those came out in 2021. My average star rating for this month was 3.7. I had a really good month. I picked a lot of good books. A lot of them were four stars. It was either three, four, and then I had one five. So it was good. All 10 of these were adult books. Eight of them were novels and two of them were novellas. Six of them were books that I read physically and two of them I listened to on audio. Okay, I'm just gonna start with what's on top here. This is An Eye for an Eye, The Doll. This is a serialized novel by John Saul, part one and um, the, I don't know, the serialized novel is called The Blackstone Chronicles. And this is the beginning. So we get a little backstory on the town. Um, I wouldn't say the main character in this is the person who runs The Blackstone Chronicles, like the newspaper, but he does play um, kind of a bigger part in what I think is he's probably going to be a reoccurring character throughout these books to make it kind of more cohesive but really we're following a family oh my gosh I'm the worst with this um the Maguires and the Maguires get sent this strange doll and their daughter Megan assumes it's for her but the mother is also pregnant and they don't know the sex of the baby yet so, you know, the mom's like, well, what if this is for the baby? Which is kind of weird because I don't think you would really like give a newborn baby a doll. And I really don't see the harm in letting a sister play with it. Even if the baby is born a girl, a female, why does it matter? But the mother starts being really possessive of this doll and it's very strange. And there's just like this strange magnetism that this doll has and both the mother and the daughter really want this doll. And um, it causes some problems. Okay, I'd like to add a content warning, but it is sort of a spoiler. So if you're planning on picking this up or don't wanna be spoiled for some reason, which I understand, just skip forward. I will hold the book down and then hold it back up when I'm done but there is a content warning for pregnancy loss. It is sad and um, it does take up, not that this is a very long book, but it does take up quite a bit of the story. So it's not, it's not something that's briefly mentioned. You know what I mean? So I thought this was okay. You know, um, an average read. Maybe it will get better as the story goes along, but like, you know, I wanna pick up the second one. It's good enough for that. I also want to include, I guess, the prompt that I read this for. This was for the smallest book you own. I also read The Beauty by Aaliyah Whiteley. This I read for the prompt that was a spooky book. So let's see, this is really a novella. There is a second like novella in this called Peace Pipe, which I just didn't read because 
I'm trying to read this for a readathon, so I didn't want to bog myself down with more reading if I didn't have to, you know what I mean, to try to get through these prompts. So the beauty is quite a tale. I'm just gonna be very brief about this because I feel like it could give a, I don't know, it's just better if you know less. So this story, um, there's this little group of men, sort of like a little village, and they are together after the deaths of all the women they know. You don't really, really know what exactly happened to the women, but you know that they've had some sort of illness that's killed them all. So now there's only men left. And one of the men sees these mushrooms growing up out of the spots where they have women buried. And eventually these mushrooms grow into creatures that have women woman-like bodies. This one is very fucking weird. And it really made me think, um, especially a lot about the roles that we give genders in our society. It's just really unlike anything I've read before. I also picked up Wounds by Nathan Ballingrude. This is a series of short stories. There's six of them. And this I used for the prompt, a book off of someone else's TBR. I had to watch a few different videos, but eventually I found something and it, because you know, I also wanted to pick something that I've owned previous to this year and you know, stuff like that. So I finally found this and I was like, you know what, this is perfect. Um, I thought that this was a pretty good short story collection. Most of them I really liked. I really liked um, The Diabolist and Skull Pocket was really creative. I also thought the mall, the mall was pretty good. So these were all, I think what I like the most about this is that they're all kind of connected um, on the cover. It says six stories from the border of hell. So they all do kind of center around a theme where it's like hell on earth or something to do with hell. Um, one story, they've got like this book from hell and in one story, there's these like hell creatures that come up on earth and decide that they're gonna stay and things like that. So um, it's pretty good. It's pretty good. Um, very unlike me to pick up two collections in one month because I don't always love them. But I also picked up Hex Life, which was edited by Christopher Golden and Rachel Autumn Deering. This I picked up for the prompt. What was it? Um, to read a book with gold, silver, or bronze on the cover. As you can see, it has kind of a nice bronzy, um, or maybe gold, I don't know. It depends on the light, huh? But this is a short story collection and the, or an anthology, and the theme is witches. So um, a lot of these were just okay, but there were also quite a few standouts. Um, my favorites were the Night Nurse by Sarah Langan, The Dancer by Kristen Dearborn, Bless Your Heart by Hilary Monahan, The Debt by Anya Allborn, and This Skin by Amber Benson. So, uh, it you know, a couple of these were from, from authors that I know I've liked, but a few of them were from new authors that I'm excited to check out. And all in all, I didn't think it was a waste of time. There were, like I said, um, stories that I really enjoyed and stories that, you know, gave me a little snippet of someone's writing that I think I might like. So there's that. Okay, this one is gonna be divisive. I read Stolen Tongues by Felix Blackwell. This was for the prompt to read a hyped book. And oh my God. If you follow um, any sort of like horror social media, this book has really taken the horror community by storm, which is kind of interesting because this was published like five years ago. It was published in 2017, I believe. This is such a hyped book. It was such a hyped book that I've been seeing this for probably six months at least and have never, been interested in it because people are saying, this is the scariest book I've ever read. This book is terrifying. This is so scary. And when so many people are saying that, it really um, makes me feel like it's not gonna be for me. But also I have FOMO about it. Like what if this is the scariest book 
I'll let her read. I can't, I can't, you know, I just can't take that risk. So I decided to buy a copy of it. I'm supporting a small, an indie author and we'll see whether I like it or not. And really, I just felt okay about this. There were parts that were very creepy. Um, the author does have a knack for kind of digging into people's fears. A lot of this, I should tell you what this is about, huh? So this is about Faye and Felix. They go to Faye's family vacation home, which is like a cabin in the Colorado woods up on a mountain. I was just in Colorado. I probably should have saved this for then, but I was too busy really to do any, any good reading. But um, while they're there, some strange things are happening in the woods. Faye has um, some sleep issues where she frequently sleepwalks and talks in her sleep and things like that. And Felix notices one night that she's talking in her sleep and then also there's something outside and it seems like it's trying to get Faye to reveal things to them in her sleep. And that's very creepy. I think people are so vulnerable when they sleep. So that's... I, I have to imagine kind of like a universal fear, right? I mean, because everyone, everyone is so vulnerable when they sleep. Despite like the spooky thing and some of the occurrences being kind of spooky, I really just thought that this was very repetitive. It felt too drawn out. I really think that the author was really heavy handed in cer with certain details, it was like he, he wanted to tell you straight out instead of showing you. And there were also a couple things that were really driving me um, bonkers because they're just like details that he must have overlooked in the timeline. It was like things don't match up. And just like, I don't know, it didn't make sense. It was like, it was winter time and then all of a sudden like, oh, two weeks later it was summer. This doesn't make sense. and there was like this ring that Faye had and the description of that changed from time to time. And it does say that this was like uh, no sleep, which is a Reddit horror thing where people post stories and stuff like that. So I'm wondering if maybe because this must have been like serialized at first that some of those details got mixed up, but it really bothered me. It really bothered me. So I don't know. There were some spooky parts, but also it was like they just, he tried to do those spooky things over and over again. And then by the time, it's like when you see the monster too much, you know what I mean? In a movie, sometimes less is more. And sometimes when you see the monster too much and you realize the monster is really not that scary looking, it's, it kind of ruins the whole movie. And I think that kind of happened with Stolen Tongues. But I'm not saying don't read it, you know? I never, I never wanna um, disparage anybody. I say that all the time, but I mean it. You know, if you think that you're interested in that book, definitely pick it up. I also read The Death of Mrs. Westaway by Ruth Ware. I think I've only got one of her books left that I haven't read now. And I read this for a prompt that was like um, a mystery prompt until the week of the because the uh, Clear Shit Readathon, it's fun because it's like a story and they give you three parts of the story at the beginning of the week and you read a book corresponding to a part of that story, right? So um, they do release the prompts way ahead of time, of course, so you can pick things out for that, but you don't really know the story until the week of. And so this was like a mystery one and you pick out a couple um, things at the beginning that are like, Part, your character stuff. I don't know. I play a lot of video games, but I don't know how to describe this. It's like when you pick your character and you pick like your character's attributes, right? And um, so this corresponded to something that I picked. It was like pick a used book. And this one I got from a Friends of a Library sale a couple of years ago. But this is about a young woman named Hal. And she is really hard up. She lives in like this dingy apartment that she's been in for forever. She has taken over her mom's tarot reading kiosk and she works on a pier. So it's really seasonal because in the winter, obviously no one's going to be hanging out by the beach in England. And 
she's just, she's having a lot of financial troubles. So when she gets this letter saying that she's been named an heir and is going, is possibly going to inherit some money from an old woman, Hester Westaway, Hal is really conflicted because she knows that her grandmother's name is not Hester Westaway. She knows that she's not this woman's granddaughter, even though she is a Westaway, um, she thinks it must be a mix up with the last names, right? She's so hard up that she decides that she is going to go and just kind of see what happens because if she can pull this off and even if she just gets a few hundred dollars, it's worth it to her because, you know, that could immensely change her life. Just a couple hundred dollars. That's how, that's how rough she's having it right now. Um, but it turns out to be kind of a, uh, a mystery and also a murder mystery. I don't know. I really love the setting of this. They end up going to this like dilapidated manor called Trapassin and Hal meets like her pretend family because she's pretending to be like an estranged member of this family and they're all very um, interesting and not all very likable, which I like. And Hal herself isn't very likable. She's a little bit, I don't know, she's a little too meek for my liking and things like that. But I don't think she's a bad character. It's just that, you know, she fits in perfectly with the story, really. So yeah, there's this murder mystery, how this mix up happened, naming her as one of the heirs because it specifically says um, Hester Westaway's granddaughter, Harriet Westaway, which is Hal's, Harriet is Hal's real name. The characters and the setting really do it for me. The mystery, not so much. I'm going to maybe get into some spoiler territory. I'm not going to flat out spoil it. So if you're somebody who um, doesn't mind a little spoilers, or if you are, you know, go ahead and skip ahead. I will put the book down and then I'll hold it back up when I'm done. So really, I mean, maybe I just didn't get some of the nuances of this plot. I was reading this on an airplane and um, there were some distractions obviously, but it really felt like this was just a weird mix up. Like it was just a misunderstanding and a mix up and that was the twist. And it's like, that's the twist. I mean, there's a little more to it, but it just, I don't know. It wasn't what I expected, I suppose. <laughs> but like I said, I think this is probably my second favorite of Ruth Ware's books. And sometimes the twist and the reveal doesn't make or break a story for me, I guess. So um, if you're someone like me, I feel like you would probably like this or, you know, if, I mean, I'm sure there's plenty of people who really loved this and loved the reveal. Okay, this one I'm not going to tell you much about because I'm going to be doing a trope video on this in January, but this is The Devil in Silver by Victor Laval, and this is about a big dude named Pepper who, hmm, you never really know if he really should have been institutionalized like this or not because he does seem to have some issues that, you know, he definitely probably could have used a therapist but also really, it seems like probably the cops just pawned him off on this institution so that they didn't have to deal with him, you know, the night he's taken in, but um, he's taken in for threatening to beat up some guy. He gets um, put in like a men mental institution in New York City. So there is a really great uh, variety of characters in here. I really liked this book, Victor Laval, narrates the audio version of this, which I listened to. Um, I kind of like alternated reading and listening and boy. Um, so Pepper's in this and there seems to be some sort of buffalo like creature creeping the halls and attacking the other patients. And Pepper doesn't understand what's going on because the staff there seems to be like covering it up almost. And so like there's this mystery of what is it and why is this happening and why is the staff acting like it's not happening? And it was a great book. Um, 
I believe it seemed like from the afterward that um, Victor Laval himself has gone through the system like that. So I, I feel like this has a sort of a personal touch that you might not get from somebody who hasn't been in a situation such as this. And it was, oh, it was a really good book. Okay, holy cow. I need to speed things up. This is Red Sister by Mark Lawrence. This was an audiobook I was listening to before I fell asleep every night and it's taken me a couple months to get into it, you know, because I can only listen to a couple minutes usually before I fall asleep. This is about a girl named Nona and in the very beginning, she's rescued from um, being hung in front of the city she lives in because um, she almost killed a very important person who was attacking her friend. On the morning she's about to be hanged, a nun comes and like whisks her away and takes her to this convent where they train young girls in fighting and in this sort of a magic and in this thing that they call the path, which is like, I don't know, like a mental thing that helps you be better at stuff. And I'm gonna tell you right now, I'm not sure if it's because it's not explained super well in this, or if it's because being an audiobook, I've had to like re-listen to parts and may have missed some of these important things, but I feel like I just don't know exactly what the fuck the path is because it seems like a physical thing, but also it's like a metaphysical thing. And uh, so I don't, I don't really know, um, but I liked this book despite not um, understanding some of the concepts introduced in it. It's like, I get how the characters can use these things and stuff like that, but I don't know. Anyways, yeah, um, there isn't a super clear plot. I think that this is really character driven in my opinion. I think, you know, it's just like a, a school setting kind of. It's a bunch of young girls who are learning how to fend for themselves and be great fighters and they're making friendships and stuff like that. You know what, I'm gonna save my favorite book for last. So I'll get to that in a second. Oh, this isn't, I just put this here so I wouldn't forget to talk about the book, which is the second book in the Scholomance series. Um, by Naomi Novik. I listened to that one on audio because I have this really bad habit of reading the first book in a series and then never getting to the subsequent subsequent books. But um, The Last Graduate came out, I think this month or maybe the month previous to this month. This is also a book that takes place in a school. So it's a school setting and it's a school for magic users, mages. And um, so in the first book, we meet a bunch of people, right, all students, and they're in this school and there's no teachers. It's like the school itself is teaching them and um, the school kind of manipulates things for them and, you know, might give them challenges and they all have to survive this thing on their senior year where they get dumped into like this dungeon, right? And there are all these mouths they call them which are like monsters like various sorts of creepy magical monsters that love to eat magic so they love to eat magic users people with the ability to use magic and uh so all throughout school really these students have to be careful of that but um you know at the very end of their sc school career they have to fight their way out of this dungeon and most people don't survive, but they have a better chance of, they have a better chance of learning how to survive if they're able to go through this class, this school rather than staying out of the school and not learning all these things from the school and trying to fend for themselves in the outside world. I don't know. The thing is about this series is that I think the school and the monsters are so much more interesting than the characters. And the school itself is really, kind of like um, a character and I don't know, the rest kind of fall by the wayside when we're talking about a magic school who is constantly trying to kill its students, kind of, I don't know. So um, yeah, the second book, I felt a lot the same, you know, like I said, the school feels like um, a more important character than anyone else. And so it's kind of hard to be 
um, worried for the characters when, uh, you know, when you don't really care about them. But I think the second one was slightly better. There's more of like a, co a concise plot, whereas the first one didn't really feel that way to me. And I don't know, I thought it was okay. Like it's a good listen. They're not very long books, I don't believe. Okay, last but not least, we have Razorblade Tears by S.A. Gosby. This was by far my most favorite book this month. This is a crime thriller, which I don't always love because um, I don't know, I just don't really like procedurals that much. And I feel like a lot of them are kind of like that, but this one is totally not none of neither of the main characters are police officers or detectives or pathologists or work in like the criminology field at all um it's just two ex felons and they're trying to find out who killed their sons um their sons were partners and they were both killed in um what the police think is just sort of a robbery in public but you know, both men don't think that, that that's what happened. And the police are very um, slow and not doing things at their pace. They decide to team up and get to the bottom of it. And boy, this is a really emotional book, uh, especially because both of these fathers have such great feelings of guilt of not being there for their children while they were alive and not being very accepting of who they were, were and who they loved. And now, you know, they're trying to kind of make amends by uncovering this mystery behind their deaths. Holy shit, you guys. If you need to feel some feelings, definitely pick up Razor Blade Tears. I mean, this is one of my favorite books of the entire year, hands down. Thank you all so much for watching. As always, I'm, um, just kind of blown away by the amount of people and like the responses that I get and I'm very grateful for every one of you. As always, I would love to hear if you've read any of these and what you thought about them. I'm sorry, there is a fly. I'm sure you see it. It just keeps like flying right past me, like right by my face and it's so irritating. I have a link to my bookshop.org affiliate page down in my description if you're interested in any of these books. I really recommend picking up Razorblade Tears if you haven't. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's all I have for you guys today. This has been a long video and I've got more to film, so I've really got to wrap this up. I hope you guys have had a really fantastic November and, you know, we're getting to the end of the year, which is kind of crazy. But I will see you in another video. Thank you so much for watching. Goodbye.